This is Talking Mule Deer with your hosts, Steve Belinda and Jody Stemmler. Talking Mule Deer takes you on a journey to learn more about the Mule Deer Foundation, Mule Deer and black tailed Deer Biology and Management, tips and tactics for hunting, conservation issues, and even features some of our corporate and celebrity partners. Now, let's start talking Mule Deer. Hey, this is Jody Stemmler, and we're back talking Mule Deer at the 2019 Western Hunting and Conservation Expo. And I'm Steve Belinda, Jody's co-host, and today we have a very special couple. We have Ron Spoomer and his lovely wife. Welcome. Hey, thank you. Thank you, guys. Great to be here. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you for taking the time because Ron Spomer is one of the names that has been historically. I mean, you you are you are part of the industry. I'm historic. No, no, no. I wasn't saying that, but you are a living legend and, and somebody who millions of people have looked up to for advice and, and thoughts. Thank you so much for pay- taking your time to be here. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me, and thanks for that lovely introduction. I'm a, I don't know if I can live up to it. You can. We'll, we'll try. Uh, well, we know you can. We know you can. <laughs> well, I've been around a while, guys. You know, I have got, got started in this business back in 1976. Wow. I wrote some magazine articles because about all I could think about in my life was hunting, fishing, the outdoors. I just loved it all. It's an affliction, isn't it? It really is. <laughs> yeah. How about an it's addiction? A <laughs> genetic <laughs> disorder, I guess. Both. But. <laughs> right. So you, uh, I mean, is your background as a journalist or do you have a, another degree or did you just decide I want to be an outdoor writer? The latter, really. Really, yes. Really? I really didn't take journalism. I did not want to be a news reporter, a strict journalist. I wanted to share what I loved about the outdoors and hunting and fishing. So I looked up to the usuals, Jack O'Connor and Elmer Keith and all the old guys who were writing back in the days of field and stream, sports and field and outdoor life. Those were the big ones. Right. And uh, my English teacher in high school said, you might want to try writing for some of those magazines I always catch you reading in class. <laughs> <laughs> if you like them so much, why don't you write for exactly. them as an assignment? <laughs> and I thought that sounded like a lot more fun than working for a living, you know. So <laughs> That's great. I tried it, and it, it, it's a remarkable line of work because you don't need a lot of overhead. You just need to sit down and write. You have to have a passion for it and yep. be willing to put up with what most people don't enjoy, which is writing term papers, you know. Absolutely. But, uh, you know, it worked out because I had the, the passion. I, at the time, I was actually a carpenter. I was working up on shingling roofs and painting barns and all that good stuff, you know. And all the while I was doing that, my brain was writing stories, and I was wanting to get back out into the woods to hunt. So I thought, if, you know, if I can quit manual labor and write what I love to do, that gives me more time to be a field hunting. Uh, so, now, Betsy, you're, you're a hunter too, right? Yeah. I'm a hunter. I didn't, I didn't grow up hunting, but I started hunting later. Uh, so you've been on this adventure with Ron through the years. And, and, and it's been an adventure. Yeah. <laughs> Tell them about the time you fell in the swamp in Africa. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I ended up in a swamp in Africa. Who would have thought? <laughs> well, yeah, uh, exactly. Crocodiles in the swamp? Uh, not that I saw, but they were there. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly you're here with us, so probably not, right? Yes. <laughs> so you're... You were known predominantly as a Midwestern writer, a whitetail guy. Is that correct? I mean, obviously a lot of things, but that, yeah. that was where you got your roots. Well, yeah, the, you know, when I was a kid growing up, we didn't even have whitetails. You know, the seasons just sort of began when I was old enough to start hunting. I can remember my aunt running into the farmhouse to hear the screen door slam yelling, deer, 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 which was no one had ever seen one before. <laughs> and there was a whitetail with two fawns running across the July cornfield. Wow. And that was one of those eye openers for a kid, like, yeah. Wow, a real deer. deer. And, of course, as you know, the conservation story, Those, the 60s were the, that was the decade in which all the conservation work that we've been doing over the decades, starting with Teddy Roosevelt and all the rest of the yep, pioneer conservation. The funding, it, yep. it started to bear fruit, and those deer were coming back, and the pronghorn came back, and elk. Even into the 70s, elk were sort of a novelty in the Black Hills of South Dakota. It was my home state. But those have come on strong Absolutely. now, too. And, of course, cougars respond to that. Wolves yep. respond to it. Just pretty much all of the wildlife resurgent in this country is due to the hunter conservationists who paid for it all. Yeah, we, we often it. forget the restrictions we put on ourselves and the sacrifices we made as hunters so that we could bring those animals back. Yeah. And now we're, we're bearing that fruit. I mean, when you look at whitetail numbers, elk numbers, 
mule deer numbers, pronghorn numbers, we're back to some pretty healthy levels in a lot of places. And the real amazing thing about that is we've done it while we're losing habitat across the board, you know. We've always got to fight that habitat loss, but with an increasing population of humans demanding more and more stuff, you have to have more highways and more space for housing and all the rest of it. We have got a fight on our hands. We've got to renew our commitment the way the Mule Deer Foundation is doing now to, to protect what we all love. We just can't sit back and hope it stays great. Well, you're, you, you speak of the incredible up, you know, upsweep of numbers of wildlife. And then we had these golden years of, of tremendous opportunity and, and almost limit The good old the days. The good old days everybody refers to. And now I think we have kind of forget. We've, we, uh, we're within a generation who does not remember yeah. when yeah. it was unusual to see a deer. And and unfortunately, we're also and increasing threat. So we're kind of getting ourselves back into a situation where if we're not paying attention, we're going to start losing animals again. Yeah. And, and mule deer have that, that habitat loss has been, so they're one of the few big game species that actually are, is on the decline in a yeah. lot of places. Yeah, and of course it ties right in with the development of the West. It used to be a pretty empty place. Absolutely. And now, like Idaho, is one of the fastest growing states in the Union. Nevada's coming on strong. I mean, people want to come out west because we have what they <laughs> don't have back east anymore, which is elbow room. Yes. People so how that. hard was it through the years to weave a conservation message into the outdoor programming? Because, you know, when I was growing up, it, you had a few programs. Uh, Marty Stauffer, you had Mutual Omaha's Wild Kingdom. You had, you know, the hunting shows, uh, the wild uh the sportsman sh- um american sportsman american sportsman yeah. Kurt and those and those always had a conservation message and yeah and then it seems like we got away from it yeah and we did and i think the reason was be people were spoiled we suddenly had so much at first we had to fight for it and really appreciated what we had built and then the younger generation came they grew up with this abundance my gosh, there were elk everywhere, whitetails everywhere. You know, mule deer, they're up one year down the next, Damn. but generally you get those swings, and when you get a high population of mule deer, it was, I think, a little bit too easy, and, and we sort of lost that conservation message. Because well, now we're fighting over things like whether we should use a crossbow or not. Yeah. You know, whether long-range shooting. I mean, right. if, you, if we would roll back time 100 years, I think the folks back then would be like, oh, we're just worried about animals on the landscape. Yeah. Right. Really, that's an ancillary argument, what you want to harvest them with. I've always said, if you want to address it biologically, you say, well, we can withstand a 10% or 20% harvest this year. Do it ethically, but we don't care if you use a crossbow or a muzzleloader or a high-powered rifle. Jody and I are both, you know, have degrees in biology and trained biologists, and that's the approach we take. Hey, you want to look at this biologically, you're looking at a graph. Yeah. You're looking at a spreadsheet of numbers. How that happens is a convenience, is an ethical argument, but really a manager's job is either to raise the population, decrease the population, or keep it the same. And hunting is a tool to help you get there. You know, I I certainly appreciate the ethics of the hunt. I think they're very important. Uh, The Boone and Crockett Club's fair chase. Absolutely. You know, all of that stuff, I think, elevates us and what we do. It shows respect for the game and ourselves and our hunting heritage, and I think that's critically important as well. But I don't think we have to overdo the the regulation saying, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Well, it, it causes resentment. I mean, we, we don't like folks, uh, a lot of folks like to be left alone by their government. Yeah. And so when we say thou shalt not in a regulatory fashion, there's whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, it creates an immediate Poor reaction, yeah, negative pushback. Response, so, right. So, Betsy, you've traveled the world with your husband to hunt and, mm-hmm. and adventures. What have you seen? Other cultures aren't as accepting as women in hunting or probably shock some folks when you went along on these adventures with, with Ron. When so. I was in Central Asia, we went hunting for Ibex. Oh, wow. and our And our guides were Russian former military, and we were the first Americans that they've ever met before, oh, wow. and I was the first American hunter. That they weren't shooting at or wanted yeah, to shoot Yeah, right. You know? <laughs> yeah. We laughed about that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said to them, you know, when I was in grade school, we were always told, if you don't behave, the Russians are coming. <laughs> and he, th- through the interpreter, said, when I was in grade school, they told us if we didn't behave, the, the Americans, Americans are yeah. coming. Yeah. And here you are with guns. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great trip. So how did they, re- I mean, did they, were they surprised to see they you? They were surprised. Uh, 
and, 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 and you're not a large stature person. You're, you're, you've been described as petite um, by, you know, some of the stuff I've seen out there on the web. I mean, how did they, oh, you pull out a rifle. I mean, I imagine a lovely their young eyes woman, just, yeah. Petite woman <laughs> with a gun. <laughs> well, I, I think they were surprised, and um, it, it was a great trip. Probably the, the, the most rem- uh, remarkable or memorable was a tracker in Africa uh, when we were in Mozambique, when I was in that swamp. And <laughs> that you fell into. Yeah, that I fell into, actually. I was uh, waist deep, if Oof. not shoulder deep. Uh, anyway, we connected on, uh, there was an incident that it would take a long time, but we were, uh, he wouldn't look at me until this incident happened. And then different cultures, different generations, um, and we looked eye to eye and we could communicate. It was, it was a remarkable time. I will never forget that. Huh. Yes, he didn't respect you at first. You were just sort of the wife of a hunter, and he couldn't believe that you actually had a 375 H&H Magnum in your hand. He was almost <laughs> tall as you are, you know. And, but when that little incident happened, when one of the fellas fell into the swamp and started cursing and wailing and flopping Having around. Having a temper he, tantrum. Yeah, he just wasn't being uh, tough, you know, wasn't measuring up. And this little l- local tracker saw a little Betsy right there just manning up. And you could see the respect. And yeah. they, cl- they looked for the first time at each other's eyes, and they kind of smiled wryly at one another about, this guy over here doesn't quite measure <laughs> up, and you do. So that was pretty interesting. <laughs> That's yeah. Well, we, you know, we, we've had a lot of conversation with folks who, like yourselves, have traveled the world to hunt, seen conservation and hunting in other <coughs> cultures, other continents, other countries. And we always come back to is you, we take it for granted how good we have it in North America. Because, A, the model, the conservation ethic, but, B, the opportunity in public land system, which you don't have in other places. I mean, is there any one thing or a series of things that you've seen where people just didn't understand how we did it or they just got into that culture block of... Yes, it, that's a good point. You see it in the urban centers in Africa. South Africa in uh, Joburg, I get it from the locals working in the airport. You're hunting? You've come over here to hunt? What, what for? What is there to hunt? They don't know their wildlife. They don't understand conservation, hmm. sustainable use. It goes right over yeah. the tops of their heads. Yeah, it's really interesting. But it, And once again, it ties in with urban centers. If right. you remove people from their roots... And they don't understand where life comes from. I think that's the, the commonality on that. My husband and I have been having this conversation quite a lot recently about yeah. that divide between the urban and the rural. Um, that there, There's certainly many more people, but the disconnect between where the resources, where life comes from. Mm-hmm. They, and then they get to the rural communities and they want to change those communities to suit their vision yeah. of what they should yes. be like rather than respecting and understanding hunting um, or, or any kind of resource extraction or habitat management. They just don't get it. It doesn't, it doesn't well, suit. Well, they definitely get it in the rural areas of Africa where we hunt because, A, they've got jobs. Right. Because hunting is a part of the economy. Instead of raising cattle and artificial animals that don't really belong there, you utilize what nature has provided. If we all want wild lands, wild places, wild vegetations and habitats, we need to utilize them. Sustainably, obviously. You right. can't overdo it. That's the mistake we made in the market hunting era. But until people begin to understand and appreciate that fact, that reality, I don't think wildlife can make it. You can't isolate them in a park and say, well, this is our sacred little sanctuary, so the animals will always be there. It no, when, work that when way. the mm-hmm. crowds on the outside have grazed off all the land and they've run out of firewood, they cr- encroach. And you can see it with aerial photographs of some of those parks in Africa. It's just a desert right up to the fence mm-hmm. line, and then it starts creeping in as they come in to poach. They don't just poach rhino and elephant. They poach anything and everything yeah. over there when they get desperate. Well, the other mistake we make, and it's a pet peeve of mine, is when we promote conservation and hunting and the need for wild places, wild things, we often go to the rural areas rather than into those urban areas where those folks have the disconnect. We preach to the choir. Yeah. And Absolutely. we don't, and, and, and we do it because it's easier to talk to people that already understand yeah. us than to go into an uncomfortable setting and try to con or try to reach people that have a completely different Well, and, and those folks living in the urban environment, their connection, daily connection with anything natural often is, is either... Is a, through, is a pigeon pooping on is them Is a pigeon pooping on them, or is the deer eating their rhododendrons, mm, yeah. or, um, or is by the animal planet where it is very much of a preservation protection. These animals are going away if we don't do something. <laughs> so it's, it's a disconnect 
to communicate, you know, sustainable and it, use. It's difficult to get a platform to reach those folks, right. too. They're not going to be reading the sorts of magazines we read. Right. Uh, so how do you approach them? I have tried over the years to get into general interest magazines, for instance. They don't want to hear the hunting no. story because or they it comes have in a as bias. something negative, like the just this week there was a article in uh, the USA Today about how someone paid a large sum of money to go hunt a mark CNN, I think, wasn't it? Uh, I think it got picked up by the wires, but it was it was spun as something negative, mm -hmm. and it wasn't. You know, if you're never exposed to the positive, of course you're going to have a negative attitude about certain things. On so. the flip side. There increasingly is a uh, story about people who care about where their food is coming from starting to hunt. Yeah, the local Millennials, movement. the yeah. local yeah. movement, yes, exactly. That, yeah, QDMA just had one in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and the New York Times had yeah. one recently as well. Oh, so good. It, is, it is starting to play yeah. to larger, broader audiences because pe when people start to recognize the lack of control they have over the food mm -hmm. that's, that they're eating you bet. and what are our opportunities, it creates an opportunity. And that is where an entree into the urban environment yeah. and the urban yeah. community. And that's why we may have missed it over the years as growing up as rural folks and hunting. It was such a natural part of it was the part world of who you were. that we knew that we began focusing more on the hunt itself than the food aspect. We just yeah. took it for granted. You're going to shoot a whitetail. You're going to have whitetail steaks. You're going to have a moose rump roast and that we didn't think we needed to You know to when you forgot about that. it? When you when you didn't get successful that year and you didn't have the, <laughs> the middle of the winter venison the, to munch on. Yeah, so. but I, I'm really encouraged by that locavore movement, uh, that whole idea when you start hearing urbanites from New York City asking about how they can go out and get a whitetail to Absolutely. eat. Oh, I think that's wonderful. Yeah. Well, and I, I mean, I, I'll be honest, though my parents were always great cooks, but, but um, it wasn't that long ago that we didn't really know how to cook game <laughs> yeah. well. High, so. <laughs> gray the whole so way through and put steak sauce on it. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure it's leather. Um, so, so the fact that not just the locavore of, of find your own, but, but the chef movement, the, the, yeah. the cuisine yes. aspect mm -hmm. of it, that we're, we're, we've talked to a number of people with that and, and how to, to really honor the animal that you've harvested. Yeah, you know, well, you look at the success of Hank Shaw with Hunter Gather, uh, yep. Cook. Stephen Rinella. Stephen Rinella. Uh, yes, you know, Scott so Lasath. Yeah. There's so many of those. Aspects. You know, a couple of years ago, coming back from a moose hunt in Alaska, I bumped into a young lady, uh, probably in her mid-30s, and she's a subsistence hunter. She was married to a native, so she saw that there were a lot of elderly folks in the village that couldn't go out and hunt anymore, but they really depended on moose yeah. or caribou or something. So she was able to hunt for them. I have friends that do that in Alaska, yeah. Fascinating story. Yeah, so great. she has really gotten interested in hunting, and she wants to understand all aspects of it. Because at the time when I met her, she couldn't understand why someone would go all the way to Alaska to hunt one moose. She said, <laughs> I got six of them last month. <laughs> and, so and you're I, taking uh, the antlers uh, out of the bush. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we are actually going to be doing some videos. She and I are, are doing a series. She wants to learn all about guns and ammo and all the different aspects of hunting. And she's latched on to me as the old timer who knows that stuff. And I said, hey, that'd be great. A lot of experience. You take Plus, me she's up a there. diesel mechanic. And yeah. We need oh, that's yeah, cool. Yeah, we need one of those on the ranch, too. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, so Betsy, yeah. Uh, Ron tells us you guys just bought a ranch in Idaho. Tell us about it. It is way out. Of, it's off the grid. Um, cool. So we have no... We have solar, wind, and a generator. Backup and it, generator. Are you yeah. in the flats or are you in the mountains? We're in the mountains. We're in, and not only that, Snow. but they've all um, disconnected at once, and we've spent yeah. some. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're having quite the <laughs> adventure this winter. We'll, <laughs> we'll get 14 inches of snow the same time that the inverter dies or the generator blows up oh, or gosh. something, and we're living by candlelight many nights, so we are really learning to get close to the land. <laughs> Actually, and close to each other to stay yeah. warm. Oh, yeah. so. that, all of the above. But I, but what I've learned, and uh, would I do it again? We've only been there six months. And absolutely. It's, it's, it's a long time before, at my age, that you really have a fundamental change in your perception. And living off the grid has done that. Good for and, you. When, and when people say we need to be green, I'm thinking we need to do that. But it's, but it's going to be a long time because it's very tough. It, 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 well, I've, had, I, I've spent some time off the grid. I've had friends that left the grid. And what they have told me and what I've, it's a convenience thing. It's about, you know, not running if you're on solar or battery power. It's about not running two items that suck up amperage at the same time. Yeah. You choose, you know, uh, you don't, you do things to 
ration your power consumption and make sure that you have it there for emergencies too. Absolutely. And one of the things is you're so grateful for when the sun comes out. You're so grateful for the energy. I mean, it's you really are getting back to the land because you just don't flip on a switch and think, oh, it's just lights. Yeah. It's it's something that has to be produced. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I equate it to getting your own meat from the land. Right. You, you get your energy from the land, you get your meat. You start to appreciate waste and not waste. You know, you get your one meal there and you fill the freezer and you this has to last us till next season. So let's not waste any of yeah. it. Same with your energy. So it just brings you back to our base, the land, which we all depend on. But it's so easy in an urban environment to lose track of what Absolutely. that's Absolutely. So really is the involves. property big enough, and I, I know I'm not supposed to ask this in the West, but is it big enough that you can do some habitat management? Yes. Yes. It is large enough. We're mostly wintering grounds for big game. Wow. Okay. But that's we've great. we've already discovered that elk will uh, do their calving. We had about a dozen cows and so calves fun. on the place in the summer calving. Um, and then in the winter, the mule deer came down for a time until the snow got too deep, and then they moved off. But they were really hammering the native f uh, brush, uh, right, mountain okay. mahogany, and then some of the sage. But the coolest thing is we have a lek with sharp-tailed grouse on oh. it. Oh, oh Colombian awesome. sharp-tailed grouse. Nice. Wow. That so we've got the cool. dancing grounds on our property. Oh, my goodness. So I fantastic. have already spoken with some biologists. I've got a Fish and Wildlife Service biologist and the state fish and game biologist yeah. working together to come up with a program that we can integrate into that land for improvements. So, Ron, I'm going to step out do. on a limb here. I'm yes. the executive director of the North American Grouse Partnership. So uh -huh. any help? that uh, you need on that stuff, I can definitely connect Beautiful. you with the right oh, folks. So. Great. That's wonderful. Glad to hear it. And here's what else I have been asked. Get me a picture of a mule deer on a grouse leck. <laughs> that is like a <laughs> unicorn grouse. out there. We've Can't been looking that. for years. We, you know, we mean sage grouse when we talk that because we, you know, that's been the big issue. But right. you don't find any pictures of mule deer on grouse lecks. You see pronghorn, you see elk, you see cows. Yes, yeah, seahorses. I've even I, seen pintails on them. Yeah, but we've been looking for that. Well, and I, yeah, I wonder, actually, if that is a seasonal use, kind of a natural habitat, natural heritage. Yeah. Type. They're moving into different country. The, the mule deer are moving up at the same yeah. time that the, the grouse are dancing. Boy, I could see where they would cross, though. Do you they really think that was well, that that sounds that's very cool that you've got that on the, your property and very nice. I will he got that. a mule deer his oh, cool. last year. On your we, property? On the ranch, I'll yes, stay. yeah. A good one, too. Uh, just a I really tried. <laughs> decent four-year-old buck. Really nice. Really and, great. and is that ever fulfilling? You know, to have your own ranch, I think most of us understand, wouldn't it be great to have your own property on right. which you can manage for the better habitat and wildlife and then to be able to hunt on it? The idea that you can walk out of your back door with your gun in your shoulder and start hunting, wow. And I was able to do it, with, obviously, with the birds. But right. then when the deer season was in, I just would go behind the house until I saw a big buck and got him. Oh, wow. That's outstanding. Right. So you're moving into a digital platform with Ron Spoomer Outdoors. Tell us about that. What's on the horizon? What can we look forward to? Yeah, ronspoomeroutdoors.com is our website in which I write pretty long articles. I don't do little short blogs like <laughs> you're supposed to do because I, I think tell him to make You don't have sure. time to no, do that. But you know what the interesting thing is? That long form digital is actually getting more, is it? keeping people on longer, good. having people look. If you've got good information and you've got good photo support yes. if and you're, you're conveying good, they'll stay. And that's the long what on I is actually better than those short ones they're finding. I'm seeing that. At least Thank my goodness. editors are telling me that. Okay, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> I, get, I get a lot of good feedback and people say, well, I really appreciate the detail because in so many websites you get the fluff and stuff. Yeah. And they just say, yeah, go buy one of those because it's cool. So I'm trying to provide really good, useful information for yep. shooters and hunters, lots of uh, ballistics and cartridge things. And then slip a conservation message in, as you said earlier, Steve. It, it's so hard to just do a hard-hitting conservation story and get your readership. Right. So you almost have to f give them a spoonful of sugar with their medicine, or the medicine with the sugar, <laughs> so that they'll read it. But, boy, it's certainly important because we're not going to be hunting or shooting anything if we don't keep this conservation movement rolling. Well, um. and, and, and hunters... And and anglers have owned it and have kind of carried that banner, but you you start to forget. We were talking about this. The that we there's there's a lot of people who will complain uh, about things that they don't like, but it's the well, what can you do about it? And hunter and anglers, yeah, we're happy to say we put the money in, but until you're out there actually doing a habitat project right. for a group like the Mule Deer yeah. Foundation or participating in these uh, you know these conservation activities. Yeah. 
you need to own that as well. And, and, and I think well, I think conservation is true of most things. Not 10% of the people do 90% of the work. Yeah. If we could get 50% of the people to do 50% of the work or, or 100 I mean, we'd be so better off. And there were polls done years ago by... Um, and they found out most hunters and anglers were unaffiliated with any conservation group. Yeah, that's and the sad thing. That, to me, baffles because the things you can get involved in and the the rewarding feeling you get to be part of an organization that right. actually goes and does conservation is great. Yep. Yeah, if you're doing any hands-on stuff, you feel so much more fulfilled when you're done. You meet your buddies out there and you, you yep. get your sweat equity put into it. And you say, you know, I planted those trees or I helped establish that grassland. Uh, even if you're putting up wood duck boxes, you know, that's a contribution. Yeah. And it and it invests you. You invest yep. your time and energy into that. It means more to you. But even if hunters just join Mule Deer Foundation or Rocky Mountain Elk or the NRA or any organizations that are fighting for hunters' rights in wildlife conservation, at least contribute that way. Yeah. Even if you don't have the time and energy to get in the field and yeah. do the hands-on. Well, and we definitely need excellent communicators like yourself and the platforms you use and getting into the modern, you know, the 21st century, you know, whether it's short-form journalism or long-form. I think, you know, those of us that are biologists and, and wonks on the policy, mm -hmm. sometimes we're not great communicators. So we need folks really, like Steve? you and Jody and, <laughs> and others to help us out at times. So. It's well, about it, telling a story. It, my, and it's my pleasure. But I depend on guys like you to give me the story. Yeah. And then I'll interpret it and put it in layman terms exactly. <laughs> if that, necessary. That's, that's what I do, too. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, that's all very important. And one of the ways we're doing it now is, of course, with YouTube. So many people grow up just watching videos. They really don't yeah. want to read Absolutely. that much. So we're really hitting the YouTube pretty hard. We have a YouTube channel, Ron's Former Outdoors, and we've got a lot of gun and ammo and technique videos on there, but I slide a little wildlife stuff in every now and then. Oh, it's a good spot for you to bring the old archives out, too, and put that, that, that quality work that's been done there, too. So. Yeah, I'll need to drag those out of the closet one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I saw you at a SHOT Show, um, and what did you see anything new? What was the, the most exciting, or what was the trend that you felt was uh, different? You've even been going these things for how many years? But yeah, too many years right? to remember. <laughs> yes, we don't want to go back that far. Sitting at Range Day. And what was, but what struck you the most out of SHOT Well, you know, year? what's really struck me the most about SHOT in the last five years or so is how it's changed from the hunting shooting to More military tactical. and police. Tactical stuff. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, great. I mean, if guys want to come out and, and shoot and play with their guns and have fun at target games and become better shooters and protect their family and their homesteads and all that stuff, great. I do the same thing. But I'm the old school guy who came in as a hunter, and it's a little disconcerting for me to sh show up with all these guys with a tactile emphasis. It, and I think it's probably because I think I fear we're losing that connection with the land and the conservation. That used to be a big driving force there at the SHOT Show. Yeah. I hope that's not the case. It just might be that we've added so much more we really haven't taken away. It just looks like there's less of the hunting yeah. because there's so much more of the tactical. Yeah. That's what but I've noticed the most. And then the other thing is I'm afraid that hunters are taking the easy path maybe a little too much. But then I also see the other side of it. For every guy that wants to shoot long range or hunt long range, you see the guy who wants to get really back to his roots and use a bow or a, a muzzle loader or some other limiting factor for more personal challenge. I can respect either way as long yeah. as it's done right. We said earlier, it's here's your tag. As long as you're living within the biological harvest l levels, I don't care if you shoot it at <coughs> two feet or a thousand yards. There's an old saying, you can't legislate morality or ethics. Exactly. And so we have our rules with regs out there for a reason. That's to give us the guidance on how we should be managing this stuff. But it's up to in individuals and it's up for society to determine what's ethical and, and individuals to determine how to act out there. You yeah. know, look in the mirror and if you don't like what you see, change what you do. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, and I don't want to condemn what we would call a long range shooter because there are plenty of short range shooters who would condemn me for shooting at three and 400 yards. Where do you draw the line? Yeah. You know, it's yeah. Like you said, it's up to the individual. As long as you have the skill to do it. But, I, yeah. you know, we've talked about this. My choice is to try to see if I can get the closest I can. Um, yeah. But if you've got the skill and the ability and the equipment, you know, perhaps that, that long range. And I'm a bow hunter, so it's always yeah. been about getting close. close so. right. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but look at a lot of bow hunters these days are going to 70, 80, 100 mm -hmm. yards even. Right. Which, when I was bow hunting back in the day, huh, 40 <laughs> yards was kind of yeah. the limit. Yeah. So... 
Is this your first Western Hunting and Conservation Expo that you've no, been to? No, we were here a couple of times. Uh, we don't come every year, but I really like this show. There's so much enthusiasm. Yeah. These Westerners are serious, and the mule deer, the mounts on the taxidermy out here, it's just crazy. Yeah. <laughs> You'll see bigger mule deer heads in here in five minutes than you will out in the wilds all your life, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, it's an amazing time. Well, we're really glad you were able to carve out time during your, your time here at the Hunt Expo. Oh, it's my spend pleasure, time with Jody. You. Thank you great. very much for all you've done for conservation, for hunting, for helping to bring good knowledge about hunting and shooting to, to the American people for a very long time. So thank well, you. Well, and not to, not to date you again, but, but for, you know, you <laughs> admit we are dated. But we all are. We well, all, Betsy, we all are, and, but. and it's, it's great to see a couple like yourselves yeah, doing this stuff. We thank you for what well, Ron has you. been able to do, and we really look forward to you guys being successful on your ranch in Idaho. So. Thank you. I appreciate that. And posted. remember what they always say, behind every successful outdoor writer, there's a woman with a real job. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, in my family, it's the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, did they did she, he did say successful outdoor right. writer. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no wow. close. Uh, okay. She's been picking on me all day. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again for your time. Thank we you, guys. You and good luck with your meal foundation. Deer. Spread the word. Thank All right. Well, Until thank you. Until next time, this is Jody Stemler. And I'm Steve Belinda, and thank you for talking Mule Deer. Thanks for talking Mule Deer with Steve Belinda and Jody Stemler. The Mule Deer Foundation is the only conservation group in North America dedicated to restoring, improving, and protecting mule deer and black-tailed deer and their habitat. MDF is a strong voice for hunters in access, wildlife management, and conservation policy issues. To find out more, visit www.muledeer.org and stay tuned for the next episode of Talkin' Mule Deer.